Scene one, Apple, take one. How y'all doing tonight? Yeah. You guys ready for this? Are you excited? Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right, so before Julian starts, remember, phones are... Okay, just making sure. All right, so tonight we're starting our series, Doubting. We were all designed to ask questions. As tall, you know, little kids, they ask a lot of questions. I don't know if any of you have little siblings, but little kids, they ask a lot of questions. My little brother, he's, he just turned three, and whenever I tell him something, if I tell him, like, if he comes up to me, he's like, hey, brother, can we do this? I'm like, no, sorry, buddy, we can't. He's like, why? I'm like, we just can't. And then if he goes and asks me for something else, he asks for this toy, that's like a dangerous toy. I'll be like, no, you can't play with that, buddy. He'll be like, why? Toddlers ask a lot of questions. But as we get older, asking too many questions is often discouraged, especially when those questions are about our faith. But in this four-week series, we'll talk about how having questions and even doubts about God might not be as scary or as shameful as we thought. Because you're not alone in your questions. God doesn't shame us for our questions. Our questions don't always get answered, and godly people can help us with our question. So for those of you wondering who have their Bibles tonight, we're going to be jumping into the chapter of Job, Job chapter 1 and 2, and Romans 8. We'll be in Romans 8. Uh, we can all agree that life can be disappointing and frustrating, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I wanted to put that to the test. So everyone stand up. So this is like never have I ever. So if you... <laughs> If you've never done these things that I say, sit down, okay? You have never experienced disappointment. You, you sit down if you've never experienced disappointment. Keep standing if you have. You have never exper experienced things going badly. You have never experienced being rejected. You've never lost something valuable or precious to you. Never lost to someone competitively. Never experienced sadness have always had all of your prayer answered in the way that you wanted. Clearly, everyone here has experienced disappointment, rejection, or unanswered prayers at some point in their life. Here's one more, you can all take a seat now. Here's one more question. Raise your hand if, you ever have, if you've ever heard or thought that following Jesus would make everything in your life okay. The question was, raise your hand if you have ever Thought following Jesus would make everything in your life okay. That's what I used to think. Yeah. All right. So let's dive into Romans 8.28, which kind of ties in with what I just said. Romans 8.28 says, And we know for that for those who love God, all things work together for good, and for those who are called according to his purpose. Some interpret that. They misinterpret it. Um, that a lot of people think that means if I follow Jesus, everything's going to be all right. But that's, that's not the case. Um, if you've experienced hardships in your life, you should know that's not true. We don't get everything we want. We still get hurt, and bad things still happen to us. So the question is, so what? So let me tell you a story about the time I prayed for something and I didn't get it. Um, I really wanted a nice, expensive camera for YouTube. I do a lot of YouTube videos. And for three years, I've been praying for this nice, big Canon camera that I've been wanting forever. And I still haven't gotten one. I prayed to God about it. And my Chris, I've gone through three Christmases, three birthdays, still haven't gotten it. And so I had a question. I was like, so like, God, why, why are you not answering this? Like, you know, I need this because my video quality is just terrible. So I need this, God. And so my questions were getting answered. But not just materialistic things. Sometimes I prayed to God to do something in my life, to change something or to change something in someone else's life. And that prayer never got answered. He, he never answered it. He never did what I wanted to. Um, so we're going to dig into the book of Job right now, but as you're turning there, I'd like you to check out this video. And I just got blessed with a good wife. Not every guy has a good wife. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, think about Job in the Old Testament. Think about Job's wife. She must have been a real piece of work. I mean, the devil took everything from Job, man. Killed his kids, killed his servants, killed his livestock, covered Job in boils and sores. But his wife did not die. <laughs> That's saying something right there, isn't it? <laughs> like, hey, devil, Job's wife's right over there. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
trust me, leave her. I know what I'm doing. All right. Jumping into Job chapter 1, sorry, in verse 1. In the land of Oz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Let me pause right there. Job was a man who obeyed God and was faithful to God. Uh, That really stuck stuck out to me. Uh, Now jumping into verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. This really stuck out to me because, like, so, you know, Satan, like, he's Satan. He, um, he disobeyed God. He thought he was powerful than God or as powerful. And he used to be an angel. He was Lucifer. So it says right here, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. I'm thinking at this point right now that all the angels are probably thinking like, wow, the audacity that Lucifer has to show his face right now. Like he's coming with us to come see God. Like, wow. All right. Jumping into verse 7, the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabines attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword. I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The challenge formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servant to the sword. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. At, At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away my... May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Do you see what's happening here? All of Job's kids just died. They all just died. Yet he's still being faithful to God right now. That's incredible to me. Just imagine it. I know it's hard to comprehend because you guys are still kids and students. But, like, that's crazy as a parent to lose all your kids. He had more than one kid. He lost all of his, all of his kids died. And yet... He was still faithful to God. I find that and this man had to be incredibly faithful, uh, had incredible faith in God. Starting in chapter 2. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present them himself before him. So Satan came again with the angels. He came to see the Lord again. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord with the same answer from before, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity through, through you incited me, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Bless you. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then. 
He is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you were talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job had everything taken away from him, but he was still faithful to God. Obviously, he had questions, wouldn't you, if everything was taken away from you? Job had everything taken away from him. We're so blessed, you know, we, we live these blessed lives. And Job just was, he, stripped, he was stripped of everything. Well, like as soon as one bad thing happens to us, we immediately go and we forget God. And we kind of distance ourselves from him. But Job stayed faithful to God. When he had everything taken away from him. I'm going to tell you a story about my personal life. That's kind of funny, actually, now that I look back at it. But there was this girl that I really liked um, a few months ago. And she was this, like, very amazing Christian girl. Like, she, she was just incredible. Like, she was very faithful to God. I saw Jesus through her. And so we became really good friends. I thought she was going to be the one I was going to marry. Because she was just so faithful. Um, I, like... My, my dream girl is the girl who loves, who's going to love God more than me. And that's how she was. And I just love that about her. And so at one point, God took her away from me. She like, didn't die, but <laughs> like, she was taken out of my life. And so that's when I actually, I honestly really did. I started distancing myself from God because I was asking questions. I was having doubts. I was asking why he would do that, why he would take what I thought was the perfect girl away from me. And I was really upset about it. And I fell into this spiral. I got, like, I got really sad. And I was just questioning, like, why would God do this to me? And I thought that was bad. And Job had his kids die. And I thought losing a girl was the worst thing to happen in my life. <laughs> so if you kept on reading Job chapter 3, you would see more pain and suffering. You would see Job crying out to God and asking him, why? Why is this happening? He had done his very best to follow God and he must have been the best. Because if you go back and look at verse 8 in chapter 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. No one. So Job, at this point, Job was the most faithful person to God at that point in time. And he was blameless and upright. And he feared God and he shunned evil. But yet Job couldn't understand why God was allowing him to suffer. Then if you keep reading all of Job, you see Job had three friends who tried to comfort him through all of his pain. But after being with Job for a week, they decided they had an answer to Job's question. They, they thought they figured it out. They, um, they, Job's friends thought they had the answers, like why all this was happening to Job. So what their answer was is very shocking. So it was quite hurtful. Their answer was... This is your fault. Bad things don't happen to innocent people, so you must be guilty of something. They were accusing Job of being guilty for something that he never did. That's, that's kind of... I would be annoyed if my friends came up to me and they were accusing me of something I didn't do. I feel like that's high school drama. I feel honestly like that happens a lot. But that's just really... Like, Job knew he, he was innocent. And his friends were like, yo, we got an answer for you. We know why all this is happening to you. It's because you're guilty. You did something wrong. This is your fault, bro. I was just like, they don't even know what he's been through. They don't know how he lives his life. Like, they, they're not him. They don't know. So, then, li okay. Also, his friends said something even worse. After, you think that's bad. These guys had the audacity to tell Job. He go, they go, your kids deserved it too. Your kids deserve to die. And they're already dead. He's saying this to them. His friends are saying this to him. After they're already dead. That your kids deserve to die. What parent ever wants to hear those words? And so that was... The, I don't know about you, but these don't sound like friends to me. I'm just saying... So then they said to him, God has a plan for you. You just have to wait and see what it is. 
I'm sorry. If I had someone who just died recently and someone came up to me and said, don't worry, God has a plan for you. It's like, okay, that's great. But I'm kind of grieving right now. So like, do you mind? And so they told him to be thankful. Thankful, it's not worse. Worse? How can it get worse? He had everything taken away from him, maybe just except for his wife. (laughs) But, like, they said, be thankful it's not worse. I don't think they understand all that he's gone through right now. They're telling him, oh, you should be thankful. You should be thankful nothing else bad is happening. That's just crazy to me. That's pretty terrible. But we don't hear things like this all the time. Maybe we've even said it to someone else. These friends of Job go on lecturing him for a very long time. When they're done, Job finally tells them, Hey, everything you've said has been really hurtful and offensive, and you're wrong. Job says he hasn't sinned against God, but even if he had, nothing he's done would deserve the kind of suffering he's experiencing. Job cries out in pain, asking God to just end his suffering already because it's all too much. In the end, God responds, God appears and speaks to Job of a great whirlwind. Take a look at this video. And Job is innocent. He is. He's also on an emotional roller coaster. At some moments, he's very confident that God is still wise and just. Yeah, in other moments, he's doubting God's goodness. He even comes to accuse God of being reckless, unfair, and corrupt. So by the end of the dialogue, Job demands that God come and explain himself in person. And God does so. He comes in the form of a great storm cloud. Now, God doesn't give Job a direct answer. He doesn't tell Job about the conversation with the Satan. Yeah, he does something very different. He takes Job on a virtual tour of the universe. He shows Job how grand the world is. And he asks him if he's even capable of running it or understanding it just for a day. He shows Job how much detail there is in the world, things that we might see every day but really don't understand at all. But God does. He knows it all intimately. He pays attention to the beauty and operations of the universe in ways that we haven't even imagined and in places that we will never see. Then to conclude, God shows Job two wondrous beasts and brags about how great they are. Yeah, they are dangerous. I mean, they would kill you without even thinking about it. And God says they're not evil. They're actually a part of his good world. And then that's it. That's God's whole defense. It's kind of weird. I mean, what was this all about? It seems to be this. From Job's point of view, it looks like God is not just. But God's perspective is infinitely bigger. He's dynamically interacting with a whole universe of complexity when he makes decisions. And this is what God calls his wisdom. So Job asking God to defend himself is actually kind of absurd. He couldn't comprehend this kind of complexity even if he wanted to. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves Job in a place of humility. He never learned why he suffered, and yet he's able to live in peace and in the fear of the Lord. Even after all that, God still didn't answer his question the way he wanted to. Job wanted to know why these things had happened to him, and God answered him. God said, I'm the creator of everything. I'm bigger, greater, more powerful, and kinder than you could ever imagine. You are so small compared to me. Job didn't necessarily get the direct answer he was looking for, but he did get an encounter with God. Job accepted this. He came to peace with it. Sometimes we ask God why, and we want answers. We have questions. We have doubts. It's hard having faith when going through rough times. Job had a lot of questions for God too, but God does not shame you for your questions. God did not shame Job for asking why. That's because God understands our pain. We learn from Job that our questions don't always get answered. Here are some questions just to think about. These are rhetorical questions. Have you ever asked God a question that never got answered? And what was it that you asked for? Have you ever asked God for something that you never received? What was it? Have other people ever tried to comfort you during a tragedy? How did they comfort you? And was it comforting? 
Has God ever spoken to you? Looking back at Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. If you continue to read the rest of Job, you'll see God restores Job's life by giving him double of everything he had before. But that doesn't take away the pain and suffering Job experienced. The verse we just read doesn't mean you know our lives will eventually have a happy ending. When we experience pain and suffering, the hard truth is that our questions don't always get answered. But God can redeem us. So right now I want to ask you guys what, you, what the definition of redeem is. Go ahead and raise your hand and tell me what the definition of redeem is. Any ideas? What redeem means? No one? Garvin? Okay. Well. To find the word you lost. Okay. Did it make up? No. Okay. To reclaim, repurpose, restore, regain. Sometimes we lose a lot, but redemption means our stories don't end there. We may not be able to avoid pain. We may not be able to fix it. We may never know why those things happen to us. But here's what we do know. God promises to redeem our story so we can know God better, help others with our stories, and being able to share the gospel with them. Become more like Jesus. If you ever find yourself in a season of suffering without reason, I pray you won't take the advice of Job's friends. But instead, I pray you'll learn to trust that knowing the God who made you is even better and more important than knowing why. We may not know how everything is going to work out in the end. Or even if it will work out. But even when we don't have every answer to every question, we can still have faith in our Redeemer. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay. All right. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Dear God, we thank you for this wonderful day that you got to come where we can all come together and worship you, God, and hear your word, God. Thank you for... Uh, this message that I was able to talk about tonight, God, and I hope that you really spoke through me tonight, to God, into the students' hearts, and that they really took something in to apply to their lives, God. Uh, we pray that we will have a blessed night, and everyone has a blessed week. We pray for Kevin, that he is safe right now in his travels, and we pray for Hannah. Uh, we pray for Jamie as he steps into this um, leader position in our worship team. We are so thankful that you brought him into our lives, God. We thank you for Azad. We thank you for everyone in this room, God. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.